alone, let's move on now to Psalm 85. For the leader of the Korahites, a psalm. O Lord, you will favor your land, restore Jacob's fortune. You will forgive your people's iniquity, pardon all their sins, Selah. You will withdraw all your anger, turn away from your rage. Turn again, O God, our helper. Revoke your displeasure with us. Will you be angry with us forever? Prolong your wrath for all generations? Surely you will revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you. Show us, O Lord, your faithfulness. Grant us your deliverance. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. He will promise well-being to his people, his faithful ones. May they not turn to folly. His help is very near those who fear him to make his glory dwell in our land. Faithfulness and truth meet. Justice and well-being kiss. Truth springs up from the earth. Justice looks down from heaven. The Lord also bestows his bounty. Our land yields its produce. Justice goes before him as he sets out on his way. I'm going to take a sort of mystical approach with this psalm because I believe that the language and the concepts are very conducive uh, towards a, a mystical way of, of looking at the psalm and experiencing it, feeling it. So we start with uh, verb tenses. And in verse 2 through 4, we have the words, Ratzita Adonai Artsecha, O Lord, you will favor your land. Ratzita will favor rendered in this translation in the future tense. But one of the uh, strange and interesting, fascinating things about the Hebrew language is that verbs in this tense, which uh, would be called the pa'al tense, can either be past or future tense, either one. Now this translation renders it in the future tense. O oh Lord, you will favor your land. You will restore Jacob's fortune. Nasata avonamecha. You will forgive your people's iniquity. Kisita chochata tam. You will pardon all their sins and so on in the future. So the psalmist is expressing the hope that all these things will come to pass. But if you check out other translations of the psalms and other Bibles, you will find that other translators choose to render this in the past tense, which would be, O Lord, you have favored your land, or you favored your land. Restore Jacob's fortune. You have forgiven, or you forgave your people's iniquity. You have pardoned all their sins. So it either could be past tense, or it could be future tense. In spite of the translation that I read for you, I favor the past tense, actually, from a more literary point of view. I think it flows better with the literary uh, uh, tenor of, of our text, because in verse 5 you have, Turn again, O God, our helper, revoke your displeasure with us. Will you be angry with us forever? And so on. So the reason why the past tense makes sense in the earlier verse is it's telling us, you have done all these things for us in the past. You've forgiven us. You've restored our fortunes. You withdrew your anger. And just as you, as, you, as you have done these things for us in the past, we pray that you will do these things again for us in the future. So I think thematically that makes sense. But it really doesn't matter. And I'll come back to that past and future tense question in just a moment. Then we have very striking verses below. As the psalmist invites, let me hear what God the Lord will speak. And then he says, his help is very near those who fear him. And then he says, chesed v'emet nifkashu, faithfulness and truth meet. Tzedek v'shalom nashaku, justice and shalom, or justice and well-being, kiss. Beautiful concept. The idea of faithfulness and truth. The word chesed can often be understood as meaning loving kindness as well. 
and they meet together. They converge in this verse. Faithfulness, loving kindness, can all, often feel different uh, than truth because sometimes truth can be harsh and direct. And sometimes when we talk about the plain truth or the hard truth, or when we say something to someone that we preface with, let me be perfectly honest with you about this, or in all candor, blank, then we wonder what's coming now. Is there going to be some kind of tough uh, truth, some kind of confrontation on the way? But in here, in this context, you have a kind of a convergence of opposites. Loving kindness and truth meet. Tzedek, justice, which can also be harsh. Justice can also imply uh, punishment or consequences in order for justice to be established. And that can be harsh. But what happens in this verse is that justice and shalom, well-being and peace, they kiss. They come together. They merge. They kiss. And then in the next verse, truth springs up from the earth. What does this mean? It means that truth emanates from the earth, namely from human beings. That we, who are so often filled with mendacity and lies, can be moved and turn to a demeanor and attitude of truthfulness, while at the same time, justice looks down from heaven. So the justice emanates from above, from God, while truth emanates and generates from below, from human beings, all at the same time. So while this is happening, you have the merging and convergence of opposites as faithfulness and truth meet, and no longer do they become opposite. But now, loving kindness becomes truth, and truth assumes kindness. And we understand that you can express truth and be truthful and be loving and kind at the very same time. And justice and shalom can kiss and come together. That what can often feel hard about justice, when tempered with shalom, with well-being, they become one. And at the same time, going back to the beginning of the psalm, the past and the future converge into the now, into the eternal present. So at the one moment, the psalmist is saying, you will favor us, you will forgive our people's iniquity. And at the same time, the psalmist is saying, you have done all these things in the past. Past and future hold together in the moment of the now. And in this eternal now, that is when we truly feel the presence of God close to us. That is when ki yidaber shalom el amo v'el chasidav, when God promises well-being to his people, his faithful ones, to all of us. When does that happen? It can happen when we train ourselves to stop ruminating and beating ourselves up about the past and regretting what has happened, and at the same moment, stop worrying and fretting about the future and about stories that may never come to pass that we make up in our heads. Instead, past and future merge into the now. And when we are able to become fully present in the eternal now, that is when we truly feel God's nearness. And at that time, we can experience what it means to be in a state of shalom, of well-being, especially at a time when there is so much sickness and so much anger and so much despair swirling all around us. Each and every one of us needs our own strong dose of shalom that we can find by striving to exist and live in the eternal 
now. Thank you.